It's warm in here, isn't it? Oh, no. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Let me, let me uh, start with this, folks. Thank you for praying for me. Yeah. I know many of you have prayed for me probably last year uh, when you heard that I ended up in a hospital with a coronavirus. And so it, it, moments like this is just a good opportunity, opportunity for me to say thank you. Uh, and thank you for your prayers. And, and uh, listen, I, when, when Pastor Tom had asked me to, uh, to come and share the word, and we finally got a date, <clears throat> there was something came to my mind straight away. Uh, that was about four or five weeks ago, I think. Uh, and it hasn't left me. And, and, and I believe it's for you. Praise God. It's for this church. Yes, and and there's, there's, there's really a couple of things that. that let me say in the offset, we can live our lives and at the end of it, we can have incredible regret. Or you can live your life for the glory of God and the souls of men. Amen. And that's really what it's going to point down to. Mm -hmm. And we'll love our families, and we'll love our wives and our husbands, and we'll love our kids, and we'll do all of that. But it will never bring the satisfaction of walking in his purpose to us. Amen. Never. Yeah. There is no relationship on this earth that brings the contentment of the purpose and will of God in your life. Nothing. And I love my wife. And I love my kids. And I love to spend time with them. And I love to mess up with them. And I love all the things that we do as a family. But I love to serve him. Mm. I love to see people's lives transformed. I love to have an input and an impact on their lives. Mm. It's incredible, folks. Let me get to the word. It says this in Numbers 13. You can go there with me. I'll be in the whole chapter, but I only want to read a portion of it. Uh, Numbers 13 and chapter, uh, sorry, verse 16. And it says, these were the names of the, of, of, of the man who Moses sent out to spy the land, and Moses called Hoshea the son of Nun, Joshua. Then Moses sent them out to spy the land of Canaan, and it says, go up and go this way into the south, and go up through the mountains, and see what the land is like, whether there be people who dwell in it, whether they are strong, whether they are weak, few or many, whether the land is good or bad, whether the cities are inhabited, or like camps or strongholds, whether the land is rich or poor, whether the forests are not, be of good courage and bring some fruit from the land. Now the time of the season was the first fruits. Uh, so they went up, spied out the land from the wilderness of Sin and, and as far as Rehob, near the entrance of Hamath. And they went up through the south and came to Hebron, Abhemiah, Sheshemiah, Talamai. The descendants of Anak were there. Now Hebron was built seven years before Sohan in Egypt. They came to the valley of Eshgal and there they cut down branch with one cluster of grapes, and they carried it between two of them, some grapes. They also brought out pomegranates granites and figs, and they called, that was called the folly of Eshgal, because of the cluster which the men of Israel cut down. And they returned from spying the land after forty days. And they came back to Moses and Aaron in the congregation of Israel in the wilderness of Paran and Kadesh, and they brought word to them and to all of the congregation, and they showed them the fruit of the land, and they said, and they told him and said, We went to the land where you sent us, and it truly flows with milk and honey and its fruit. Nevertheless, the people that dwell there are too strong, and they're fortified and very large. Moreover, the descendants of Anak are there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. The Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses. It says, let us go up at once and take this possession, for we are able to yes. overcome it. But the man who had gone up with them says, we are not able to go up against these people, for they're stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land, which they spied out through the land, which we have gone up as spies to the, 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 uh, devour its inhabitants. And all the people who saw these great men of stature, they were giants, descendants from Anak that came from giants, and we are like grasshoppers, in their sight. Amen. Father, we bless your name. And Lord, I, I ask you to, Lord, speak to your people. Lord, let them see the heart of God. Amen. Let them not just hear the voice of a man. 
with the Father that he was the voice of God Almighty. Touch them this morning. Because Father before us is something incredible. There just needs to be a people that will reach out and take it. So Lord move I pray in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. It says, and the Lord spoke, sent man to search out the land. And folks, Moses picks out men of Israel of, of, of each tribe. But there's something that, that is very interesting in, in the very offset. He says, the time, or the Bible indicates, it was the time of the first fruits, or the time of, of the first fruits of the grapes. Question is, why is that significant? And the reason it's significant is, is this. It was the most dangerous time to take on a mission. It, it was foolish in the natural sense. It was dangerous. It could have had massive consequences. It could have resulted in, in men being badly injured or even killed. And the reason for it was, was because the first fruits, the grapes were ripe. They were guarded by, by, by men, some giants. And so to take on this mission, they had almost every right to say, Moses, why, why don't we wait until it's not the time of first fruits? It's not the most dangerous. It's not guarded maybe on the same scale or the same magnitude that it is now. And maybe we'll do it when there's a, a more convenient season. And folks, sometimes that's, that's the questions we ask. When the Lord comes and puts his finger on your life, our usual response is, but hold on Lord, now is not the right time. I've just got married, I've just got a husband, I've just got a kid, I've just got a family, I've just got a new job. Maybe, maybe this time next year. Why? Because we want God to do things in our timing rather than us do them in his purpose and his timing. That's right. And that's what it is. Well, Lord, maybe ask me when I have more money next year. Maybe ask me when the finances are in a better situation. Maybe ask me, Lord, to go and do mission or, or travel with a better car. I remember when the Lord first asked me about, about even stepping into anything mission mindset in this country. It was me and my friend. We decided to travel through every city and town in Northern Ireland and preach. And the two of us between us, do you remember the rental fives? <laughs> Anybody remember rental fives? Where were we from? The 70s, 80s? Well, me and him in the year 2000s uh, had a rental five between us. And it wasn't the best. <laughs> we travelled everywhere in it. We could have waited for a more convenient car. In fact, two of the people that we looked up to at the time were Ray Comfort and Kirk Cameron. You ever heard of them? They were riding about in the Mercedes. And we says, Lord, would you get us a Mercedes? It never happened, folks. You see, we can always, always wait until there's a better time. You know what I've come to learn? God does not operate that way. He will ask you to do things in your life when it seems that there's a better time to do it. Why is that, folks? Because we have to lean on the strength of Almighty God rather than the strength of self. When you lean on your own strength, you have a claim on it. When you have no strength of yourself, when you don't have the finances, when you don't have the outworkings, when you don't have the resources, you've got one place to lie upon and rest on, that's God Almighty. Yeah. When God called me this year to leave Teen Challenger last year, in fact, it was 2019. I began to chat with my wife about giving up Teen Challenge. And when I was beginning to, to process that thought, it was horrendous thought to me. I had birthed it, I had started it, I had founded it, I had built it with many others. But essentially, it was my baby. I remember wrestling this out and, and come to a place in, in, a, in a short time where the Lord had spoke to me, told me it wasn't mine. It wasn't my baby, it was his work, it was his, I was just a steward of it. Wrestled it out, the Lord finally released me and says, now I want you to go into the full-time pastorship of the Ark Church. And here was my automatic thought. 
Hold on, Lord. How can I go from this straight away into this? I was on a healthy wage at Teen Challenge. I was well looked after at Teen Challenge. We had built up credible, not an incredible amount of finances, but enough finances. I was getting paid handsomely every single month in Teen Challenge. People were great to me, good to me, loved me. Uh, I was respected in Teen Challenge. I had a wonderful new congregation building in the yard. But here's the bottom line. There was 15 of his folks. 15. And the Lord put his finger on and says, now is the time to move. And I says, Lord, <laughs> do you know how much we were bringing in per month? £480 a month. And the Lord is telling me to step out and become a full-time pastor of the army. I says, Lord, what about, what about when the congregation grows a wee bit? The finances are more stable and I can look and can see there's generally, I can, I can live off something. No way, now's the time to do it. Now's the time to step out. Now's the time. By the way, our rent was 300 quid. <laughs> our, our, our liability insurance was 45 quid. Our gas was 45 quid. And our electric was 50 odd. Do you see how much was left? <laughs> there wasn't much, folks. We had no online banking back then. We, re we, we rested. We rested in whatever came in on a Sunday morning on a Sunday night. The week I left Team Challenge was the week I became sick. And the week I came, when I went into hospital, I came out of, I went into hospital, there was no lockdown. I came out of hospital, there was a lockdown. My church was closed like many others. There was no finances. I had no job. I had nothing left. The, the, tea, or the, 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 the art account had very little in it. If I wasn't even enough to get me a wage. Lord, why do you ask us to do things at the most inconvenient of times? I came out of hospital, not, I've shared this with a few people. I came out of hospital, folks. Two days, I was still so weak. I sat at my computer because I heard that there was a government scheme that I might be able to benefit from to try and get some sort of a wage. I went on, I rang them, and they said to me, you cannot benefit from it because you're not employed. He says, I'm only employed just, just from March. It doesn't matter. You can't benefit. You're no longer employed. I says, can I get a self-employment benefit? You can apply for it, but you won't get it because you haven't been employed for self-employed for longer than a year. You can't get anything. I says, then what am I supposed to do? She says, you can try and apply for universal credit, but it'll take maybe six to 12 weeks to get anything back. She says, that's the best I can do for you. Folks, God at times puts you in the most difficult of positions for this one reason. Are you prepared to trust me? Yeah. That's it. I came off the phone. I said to my wife, that's it, Juan. I don't know where we're getting a, a, a payment from. She was furlong. She's part-time. She only works eight hours a week. Nothing. Straight out of hospital. Put in a position, oh God, help us, help us. I was sitting in the dressing gown. Help me, oh God. A man rings me up and says, Lee, could you send me your bank details? I want to bless you. Never asked, never saw it, never put it out there. Didn't know whether he was giving me a fiver, a tenner. I didn't know what he was doing. He sent me a thousand pounds. That was enough to see us through the first month. <clears throat> Folks, God has a way of putting you into circumstances at times that squeezes you. Squeezes you. That you may trust in him. It is the most inconvenient of times. And so he searches out this land. And they come, and here's the report. The land truly flows with milk and honey. But nevertheless, the people that dwell in the land or of all cities are, are very great. And moreover, we saw the, the children of Anak. And then he goes through all these different people that are there. 
the Amalekites who are, or Amalekites, who are they? They're from one of the Esau's grandchildren. Hittites are the descendants of Heth, the son of Canaan, the great grandson of Noah. The Jebusites are descendants of Noah, uh, uh, son through son uh, Ham, Noah's son. Uh, Amorites uh, are, are, are an ancient nation mentioned in the Old Testament, came from Canaan. And the Canaanites are a wicked, idolatrous people. And folks, God has is, is put these men in a place and a position where all they can see around them is wickedness. They see the land, they see how great it is, they see how wonderful it is. But, but they look at the people and they see the, 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 the wickedness that comes from it. And all that comes out of these tribes, all that comes out from these people. But then they, they say this one thing that really sets it apart. And we saw giants. The sons of Anak, which are giants, and we are grasshoppers in their sight. And folks, this just takes it to a whole new level. A whole new mindset. Because as they come and see these uh, sons of Anak, who are they? They're a race of giant. They're strong, they're formidable, they're, 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 they're war-hungry people. They're a war-hungry race. They like to go to war, they like to fight. Uh, they're, they're long neck, and some even will believe they're maybe even descendants of what is the Nephilim. That's a whole other uh, topic. But, but, but the reality of it is this, folks. The Nephilim, or, or the sons of Anak, are a people to be feared. And, and regardless of all the wickedness of all the other tribes, what they say is there's a group of people here, and they're too great for us. We can't take them on. We, we don't stand a chance against them. We can't fight against them. We're a lost cause. They looked upon it. And you know what's incredible, folks? They recognize that yet the promise of the land is incredible. It is a land that flows with milk and honey. It's wonderful. It's beautiful. It's incredible. It's everything we thought it would be, but there's people there and we can't take them on. They feared the giants more than anything. They feared the sons of Anak and it resulted in that they looked upon themselves as grasshoppers. Folks, can I say to you this morning, it's okay to be a grasshopper. And although they said that to themselves in a derogatory term, they looked at themselves as someone that was feeble, that was weak, that was ineffective, that had no real great purpose in this life. You know, sometimes I feel that we as the church see ourselves like the people of God back then seen themselves. We look at this world at times and we ask ourselves, how? How do we take it on? How can we affect change? How can we change our community? How can we change our city? How can we change our nation? How can we, some of us even look and go, how do we change our family? We look at the massive problems. We look at the huge, huge problems even in our farms. And we, we ask, how do we do that? How do we take on something, folks? How do we take on a, a land, a city, a community? And earlier, how do we do it when all we see ourselves is insignificant? If all we ever see ourselves is a people that can never have influence in a, in, a, in a sphere, in a community, or a city, we will never do anything. If we never recognize who we actually are uh, uh, in, in Christ and what we have and what we possess and what we can take, we will never do anything. If all we ever see, we're just grasshoppers. Trumping up our life. We will never amount to anything, church. We will never achieve anything. We will never attempt anything. We will never do anything. We will sit in our seats. We will do nothing and let the world dictate to us what we're supposed to do. We'll sit and we'll just shrivel away. You know, the world has... And I, I, I need to be careful what I say. I asked myself the question throughout this pandemic, pandemic, have we as the church not give the world the hope that it was supposed to have? Mm. Honestly. Mm -hmm. 
because we have shrunk back and we have just let the world pass by. Yeah, right. I know we're doors shut. And I'm not here to talk about that, but I ask myself the question. Have you been a voice of hope to a world that is looking for an answer? You see, we have had to contend with many giants this last year. Whether we hug, whether we fist bump, whether we embrace, whether we wear masks, whether we don't, whether we can handshake out in the street, whether you, you if you had those awkward moments yet in Asda, where you see someone you haven't seen in, in, in weeks, months, and you're sort of like, who, who's done that yet? You know, well, what do you want to do? What do you want to do? I don't know. Well, come on. <laughs> who's been there? Have you been in that moment yet where we're walking through and someone sees you and you sneeze and it's well, Step aside from you. I met a girl, she she seen me online and said, and she says, I can't believe I've met Pastor Lee McLeod. And she went to shake my hand and then she went, Oh, oh, you've had coronavirus, haven't you? I says, Well, that's the basis on which you know me. She says, I'll not shake your hand then. <laughs> this was nearly a year later, folks. You see, giants have rose up and have stopped us. You know that we're afraid to lay hands on people as the church. Can I pray for you? Up on me. Can I lay hands on you? Wow, oh, we got gloves on. Now hold on, there, hold on. Let me get a sanitizer right <laughs> Come on. on. <laughs> Did you know that's what we've come to? I'm not talking about just in the church. I'm talking about even the streets. Do you know what I've learned? What people have said to me in my church, yeah, coronavirus might be a problem, but my mind is tortured. Please pray for me. My body is sore. People are looking at those folks. And I just wonder how we shrunk back and not stepped into what God actually has for the church. And I'm not saying that to be critical of any, any place or anything. Th these are questions I've asked me. Because, because here's what I know, folks. When you turn up at the hospital, the hospital generally doesn't turn you away. I don't know if you've ever had to turn up at any. Do you know what the church is supposed to be the greatest hospital on the planet? For a broken world and a broken society that are hurting not just with physical ailments but with spiritual they're giants that have rose up but also what giants will do for you personally giants will stop you fulfilling i believe what god has for your life for for the church for your church for I remember a girl came and says to me, Lee, I want to do something. I want God to use my life in the ministry of Teen Challenge. And I says, he'll do absolutely nothing with you until you knock them cigarettes in the head. She looked at me, you know, you serious? I says, I'm absolutely serious. Until them cigarettes are knocked in the head, I says, do not expect God to do something significant with your life. She looked at me and she says, well, smoking gets you into heaven, or it doesn't stop you getting into heaven. I says, you're absolutely right, it doesn't, but it will stop me using you for the glory of God and the souls of man. I says, because you cannot preach about freedom from sin and yet still be in bondage to smoking. She went away, she was frustrated, she was angry with me. She came back a week later, she says, Lee, you're absolutely right. You're right. I've given them up. I want God to use me. Amen. Folks, listen to me. In her mind in that moment, it was a giant. It was, how can I stop these cigarettes? How can I get over them? How? 
when she realized that it may be an obstacle from God using her to her fullest potential, she went and wrestled it out. There's sometimes in life that the giant in your life will be the reason you cannot walk to where you need to get to. And if you don't kill it, if you don't take it on, if you ever see it more than what it is in your life, you can never fully walk into your purpose. You can't do it. You can't do it. I'm, not, I, I, I'm listening, folks. Listen to me. I'm not saying we will ever reach sinless perfection. Don't, don't take it in that light because we, we won't. But there's sometimes things in areas of our life God has to put his finger on and say, I can't use you while you're in this place and in this circumstance. And if you see the giants greater in your life, how can you expect people in their life to overcome the giants in their lives if you can't deal with a giant in your life? How? You see, they lifted up their voices and they cried at this report of fear. And he says, we can't take this. Folks, what is it about fear and negativity that hinders the people of God from going into their purpose? What is it about fear that stops us stepping out? All of us experience it. All of us have it. All of us will go through it. What is it about fear that stops us and, 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 and you from stopping out? What is it about negative people? Negative people that are in your life, that, that never build you up, never encourage you, never strengthen you, but all they do is pull you down. I said it to my church last week, what is it when the sun's out shining and you go, oh, hallelujah, it's great today, the weather's fantastic. And then they turn around and say to you, oh, the clouds are coming. <laughs> what? We're not, we're not talking about the clouds, we're talking about today. All they see, it's a, it's a negative mindset. You want to do something for God? But can we really do that? Have we got the money? Have we got the resources? Have we got the men? Have we got the people? Folks, if we start looking at all the things we don't have, close the doors, put on a lock, and that's it, it's finished. It's over. No point. Because if all you've got around you is negative people, if all you've got in your life is people that say to you, but... But you see that we issue, see that area, but, 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 we will do nothing. We will look at everything. What is it about negative people or fearful people that God says in the book of Deuteronomy, and the officers speak to the, shall speak to the people, and they shall say, who is the man that is fearful and faint-hearted? Let him go home, return to his house, and let it, lest his brother's heart faint as well as his. Yeah. What is it that God takes so seriously that negative people are not good people to be around? What is it that is so serious that God says that if there is anybody negative in the camp or in the, in the military procession, send them home because they will spoil those that have a brave heart. What is it when you're going to war? And military people will tell you this, that when they look around at the soldiers that they're with, that they will only go to war with the people that they know have their backs. What is it, church, that negative people influence uh, even uh, people that are positive? But positive people find it hard to influence people that are negative. Strange that, isn't it? Let me go on so I don't keep this too long. The church needs men and women that will be like Caleb and Joshua. Caleb still the people and says, let us go up at once and possess it. For we are able. In the midst of chaos and fear, Caleb says, let's go. Let's take this. Let's do this. Let's, let's take this land. It's ours. It's great. It's incredible. It's, it's marvelous. We can do this. And that's essentially what Caleb and Joshua are saying. They're saying, yes, there's fear. Yes, there's chaos. But listen, we can do this. We can do it. Folks, you know what the church needs again? 
men and women that will stand up and look at the situation and say, we can do this. We can take this land. We can do this. We can do something in our community. We can do this. We can do something incredible for the glory of God and the souls of men. We can do this. You see, the Bible calls them men of another spirit. Was Caleb, as the other men brought fear and doubt, Caleb and Joshua bring hope and faith. But you know what I thought was absolutely beautiful? Caleb could see in others what they couldn't see in themselves. Caleb stilled the people and said to them, let us go, for we are able. Mm -hmm. Do you, know what is, do you know what is incredible, folks? There's people that we meet in life and they'll never see what your potential. They'll never encourage you. They'll never build you up. They'll never put their arm around you and say, come on. They will constantly put you down. They'll constantly say, You're, you couldn't do You can't do this. You can't. You can't. You can't. Caleb was of the other man. He says, he looks at them. He eyeballs them and he says, we can do this. He sees something great in them. And I often see, I, I've seen the, the worst of people, a lot of you know the, the ministry I've been involved in over the years, and even still in, in, in church life, I look at people, I know their problems, I know their circumstances, I see their weaknesses, I see their failures, but yet I see in them, there's something incredible in you. Oh, if you can see it, only if you can rise up and see what God sees. It's like, it's like Gideon, mighty man of valor. Oh, what? Are you serious? Oh, only if you could see what I say. Why don't we start going around people? I'm beginning to say to them, there's something incredible we can do. Yeah. There's something marvelous we can do. You see, he sees in them something incredible. I want to fly him on. Where am I? <laughs> he gets to the crowds as I say, he see something, but listen to this. The bottom line of it is that people never, never listen to Caleb and Joshua. And the sad thing is even the leaders never listened to them. Now the leaders might have recognized we needed the people behind us or whatever. They never listened. For 40 years or, or 45 years, Caleb carries something in his heart. Yeah. For 45 years, he carried the hurt and the pain of what they could have taken. Mm -hmm. He lived his life knowing, wondering, asking, thinking, and no doubt talk with his family about it. We could have took that. Yeah. Every day they walk around in the world. We could have took that. We could have had that. You know, there's nothing worse, folks, than living in the past. How do you know that? Do you see when the leadership changed from Moses to Joshua? Do you know the first thing he does? He goes to Joshua. He says. He says, I'm as strong as the day I was back then, Joshua, when me and you wanted to take a lot. He says, give me the permission to go. Take it. Folks, what is it about men like Caleb that carry this burden, that carry this call, that look and see things in God that others just don't see? The Bible calls them men of a different spirit. That's what the Bible calls him. God honored this man. He says, give me the mountain where the Lord spoke in that day. For you heard in that day how the Anakins were there and the cities were great and fenced. If the Lord be with me, listen, then I will drive them out. And there was his answer. There was his mindset. Oh, if God's with me. Do you know what? He was willing to die in failure. He was willing to go. He was willing to take. He was willing to, to, to look with agony. He was willing to die and say, oh, he, I, was, I was willing to take it. 
But he knew if God's with me, I'm going to drive them out. Folks, there's something about fear that will stop you even taking a step. Stop you taking even a step. Stop you even dipping your toe in the water. He says, if God's with me, I'm going to drive these ones out. What's hindering you? Come on, ask yourself the question. What's hindering you? What's hindering you in this church? What's hindering you in your family life? What's hindering you in your marriage? What's hindering you in your family? What's hindering you? And our husband, and our wife, so by the time you've been grabbed by the scruff and I can say to them, listen, I'm going forward with God and if you're not with me, I'm moving forward. Leave them behind. Might be easier said than done. But sometimes we come to say no. When he says, are you going to church again? I'm going to church. Why, what about spending time with me? I'm going to church. Vice versa with the husbands and wives. Sometimes we put everything else first. But the work of God. The call of God. And this might sound so simplistic. And, and you might say, oh, Pastor Lee, oh, if you know my circumstances, if you knew the challenges I have, if you knew the circumstances I have in my life, folks, let me tell you, I have had circumstances. I have had challenges. I still have challenges. I have looked at every conceivable failure in my life and I've said, Lord, can I do this? You know what he replies back? If you put your trust in me, yeah. I'll do it for you. I just need you to respond. I looked at our church when the Lord asked me, and I'm finishing with this, I know my time's up. I looked at my church The week I was leaving, or, or the, the month I was leaving, and I says, Joanne, can I do this? Can we do this? Can we really step out with 15 people? YouTube was our worship set. YouTube was what we used to worship. I walked out, and all I seen was a bunch of people that were ex-drug addicts, failed marriages, family lives broken. I said, can God really take us and do something incredible? He can. Amen. Amen. And I remember him speaking and saying, Lee, I can, I can do it just step out. One of the hardest things I ever had to do Hardest things I've ever had to do. Coronavirus blitzed us as a congregation. Almost wiped us out as a congregation. Get down, get whittled this down to about eight of us left. That met the prayer. So all there was. But eight of us left, Pastor Tom, on Zoom. Crying out to go, what, what? Me and my wife, oh, well, folks, have you ever seen me at times? Coming off, oh, on, what the heck have I done? Trust him. The giants in my mind were saying, walk away. Why put yourself through this? Why go to bed with tears in your eyes? Why all the heartache? Why carry this pressure? Why, why, why? Because I see that the land is full of milk and honey. I can see there's something incredible. Oh, I can't really touch it all, but I can see it. I stepped out, folks, yes. Still have fears. What God has done for me and my wife and my family and my church has been nothing short of incredible. It's been wonderful. There's still challenges. Still, still challenges ahead. But you know what? And I've said this, and I'm saying this to you. I would rather die in failure. I would rather live my life and have failed in some way, shape, or form, knowing that I've stepped out believing God. Mm 
Some might say that's reckless. <laughs> it's only very reckless. I would rather step out of the boat like Peter and begin to sink than do nothing with my life. I would rather do something than nothing. I would rather be accused of being a fanatic than being accused of a spot to sit in a seat. And let me finish in this. Only two people decided out of the 12 that they wanted to do something for God. Do you know what I've learned, folks? I would rather have the two than the 12 yeah. or the 10. I would rather have people around me that want to do something that knows. They'd rather have the cry of those saying, oh, you don't want to do that, you don't want to do this. Give me the two. They will look and say, let's go and do something for the glory of God and the souls of men. I'd rather have them. Amen. I don't want the crowds, folks. I don't want the big, I'm not, I'm not after the big numbers. I'm after a group of people that will look and see circumstances and situations and say, if God be with us, we can do this. Amen. And I hope that that's going to be your heart as a church. That you step out Amen. and you realize that in Christ, he can use you. Amen. Amen. Father, bless your people. Yes, glory to God. Encourage them and strengthen them. Oh God, in these days we need you more than ever. Help them be all that your people need. Father, let us be of the spirit of Caleb and Joshua. Mm -hmm. Let us have the heart and the mindset in Jesus' precious name. And for the glory of his name for the souls of men and women. Mm. Amen. 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 Folks, Pastor Tom, thank you for having me. I got a wee bit excited there this morning, will you? Yes. Listen, I want to do something for God. And I just like to encourage you go and do something. Impact your family. Impact your loved ones. Impact your church. And impact your community. Let them know that you're willing to do something for the king. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 Praise, the Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lee. Bless you, brother. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Guys, and all we think to remember as well, too, just in your prayers, Brother Lee has a, a, a tent mission at the end of the by the end of this month. Please do remember that in your prayers or even listen, go down and support him as well too. Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Sorry the last week of, of July. So, uh, and what I think is wonderful about this man as well is this, they don't know where they're gonna put the people in the church, but he still reaches out to see other people see him. <laughs> Hallelujah, <laughs> praise the Lord. You know, so God's good. But good, guys, have a great, great day. We're back again yeah. here at seven. We wanna hear Lee again, he's down the road at seven, but uh, we'd rather see you here, yeah, uh, uh, right. upstairs. No, no, well, come here, <laughs> come here. <laughs> but Pastor Paul Evans, Upstairs, come on along with us. Jesus. Get a wee time of fellowship, we chat, and, and let's talk about even what we heard this evening and say, What are we going to do for you, Lord? Where, where are you going to lead us and where are you going to direct us in Jesus' name? We're going to be blessed. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah.